Murder is the ultimate crime and holds an endless fascination. In this programme, we're going to look back in the files at the bloody case of slaughter on a summer's night and re-examine it with the help of a 21st century jury of experts. Psychologist and profiling expert Kerry Danes, journalist and crime novelist Hilary Bonner, retired senior police investigator Mick Turner and forensic scientist Alan Baker. What was the method? What was the motive? How was the investigation conducted? Were clues missed or deliberately ignored? Today we ask, who was responsible for the slaughter on that balmy summer's night? On the night of June the 11th, 1936, Constable William Muggridge was called to a family farm near Kingsbridge in Devon. A man more accustomed perhaps to confronting after-hours drinkers and schoolboys cycling without lights, he now found himself privy to a bloodbath of appalling savagery. This is the area of Devon known as the South Hounds, just a few miles from Plymouth. It still exists in its own timeless world. It is a place of river estuaries, orchards and lonely farmsteads. Nothing bad you think could ever happen here. But on that summer's night, the young constable arrived at the farm to find blood seeping in a scarlet stream from beneath a closed door. Beyond it, in the upper kitchen, lay Gwyneth May, lying in her own blood, dying from severe wounds to her skull and shoulder. Beside her lay the head and part of the shaft of a double-ended walling hammer. Most poignantly, a pet spaniel licked the young woman's face. She was just 25 years old. Further into the room, more horrors awaited. The policeman smelled burning and bounded up the back stairs to the bedroom of the elder daughter, Joan. The door was ablaze. But dousing the flames, PC Muggridge rushed into the room to find the bed empty, but with its pillow spattered with large patches of blood. Following the trail of bloodstains, the officer found Gwyneth's 28-year-old sister, Joan, lying dead in the passageway with injuries to her head. In the master bedroom, Muggridge found the partly burned body of the mother, Emily May. Her nightdress was charred. Like her daughters, she'd bled profusely from the shocking injuries to her head. The bedclothes had been doused in paraffin. Lying on the bed was the master of the house, 72-year-old farmer Thomas May. He too had head wounds, but mercifully, the elderly man was alive and conscious. What are you doing in my room, he asked. Where's my wife gone? Muggridge struggled to take in the carnage. People, I'm sure, think that police officers go into this type of scene without any kind of apprehension, but actually the opposite is true. Even in a, a long police career, you won't go into the scene of a murder first on many occasions. The officer who works on a rural country beat will have gone in, found the body of Gwyneth who'd been savagely attacked, and all kinds of things will have gone through his mind. Is there anybody else in the building who's also injured, maybe alive, and might need his assistance? And perhaps just as importantly, is the maniac that's done this somewhere in the building? Are there lights to help him search? And of course, we mustn't forget that in those days, the officer won't have been able to summon assistance from his colleagues quickly by personal radio or mobile phone. He'll have had no choice but to go and search the rest of the building on his own. But whatever trauma he felt, the constable alone was now in charge of the crime scene. 
The crime scene in this particular case, from a forensic point of view, is very interesting because there's, there's a wealth of forensic material for any forensic scientist or scenes of crime officer to, to basically assess. Tom May was fairly extensively injured and it's fairly apparent that uh, that may have had some bearing on his physical capabilities to commit the crime. So in actual fact the examination of, of the room in which Mr May was found would have been very significant in terms of whether he could have been assaulted in that room or indeed whether he'd administered those wounds to himself. And the fact that if Mr May had been assaulted with a particular weapon, how that weapon would have caused a distribution of blood around the inside of the room and indeed onto any clothing or indeed any, any other items within that room. From the horrors of the night, one macabre detail stood out above all others. The two daughters each had pillows placed beneath their heads. And even Mrs May's head rested on folds of soft material to cushion it from the hardness of the floorboards. This seemed like a caring act. Did it mean that the crime had been committed by someone close to the family? My first job in newspapers was as a cub reporter on the South Devon Times, uh, a newspaper that covered Kingsbridge. The family were always represented as well-liked pillars of the local community. And every time the case was discussed, the same question remained unanswered at the end, which was, could Farmer Tom really have done it? But such possibilities had yet to be considered, for now the police had to quickly build up a picture of the May family. They had farmed the 300 acres of West Charlton since the 1840s, closely involved with the local church of St Mary's where young Joan taught in the Sunday school. For the Mays, continuity was everything. Some of the farm workers had served the farm loyally for up to 40 years, even within the often oppressive confines of a close-knit rural community, the family appeared to have no obvious enemies. Indeed, for the father, wife and the two daughters, June the 11th was stultifyingly normal. Tom May had spent much of the early evening seeing a veterinary surgeon and an accountant. So who had wanted to harm these close-knit churchgoers on that traumatic summer's night? The sisters Gwyneth and Joan had apparently spent the evening with friends near Blackpool Sands on the coast between Kingsbridge and Dartmouth. The police learned that the May family also had a lodger, 22-year-old farm worker Charles Samuel Lockhart. That evening, Lockhart had walked to a dance at a nearby village hall. He had returned briefly to the farm to collect a coat and then finally returned home at 2.45 in the morning when the dance ended, letting himself in through the unlocked door. Once inside, Lockhart saw the blood pouring from underneath the door. Later, prosecutor Roberts QC would observe, showing unusual wisdom for his youth, he, Lockhart, investigated no further but hurried off to knock up the village policeman and two farm labourers. So the police had a total of three suspects. Lockhart, the only person at the crime scene and uninjured, the father, injured but conscious, and the possibility that the crime had been committed by an unidentified intruder. Meanwhile, Thomas May was displaying a robustness of constitution that was truly astonishing. Despite his considerable injuries, his skull was fractured in three places, the 72-year-old insisted that he didn't want to go to hospital. Police noticed that his nightshirt was dirty and soaked with paraffin and blood, so he had obviously been out during the night. The man will be coming for milking, he said, and he was expecting a load of manure to be delivered. Thomas May was going to survive and seem very calm, but the death toll of two was about to rise. At 4 a.m., his daughter Gwyneth was brought to Kingsbridge County Hospital, where she fought for her life for four and a half hours before dying from her injuries. Meanwhile, as the sun rose over the family farm, the police were arriving in numbers. There was hardly a section of the house that wasn't splashed with blood. Although there were imprints of naked feet on the floor of the farmhouse, police appeared satisfied that there had been an intruder from outside. 
Inquiries continued while Thomas May recovered from his injuries at a nursing home in Plymouth. Then, on Tuesday, July the 14th, police took action that shocked the rural community in the South Hams. Officers arrested the elderly farmer. I think it absurd making this accusation, he replied. I love my wife and daughters too well. With his head still bandaged, May was driven back here to Kingsbridge, where at the Old Town Hall, the magistrate formally charged him with the murder of his wife and two daughters. Did the police need to arrest somebody and just turned to, to the only person that they had at that time? Were they just thoroughly incompetent? Or was there something about Tom's performance that night that just didn't sit right with them? So maybe something about him was raising questions and causing the hairs on the back of the neck to raise that highly unreliable scale of somebody's guilt. What had persuaded the police to arrest Thomas May? What about the possible role of Lockhart or an intruder? Would their case stand up in court against May's protestation of innocence? And if he didn't do it, then who did? The committal hearing against Thomas May opened on July the 29th with G.D. Roberts leading the prosecution against the farmer. His case relied on two pieces of evidence. An examination of Thomas May's feet suggested he had made a journey across the yard to fetch paraffin to set a fire and destroy the evidence. The prosecution's second line of attack was that the placing of pillows beneath the victim's heads suggested a close relative had murdered them. Whose hand but his could have placed those pillows under the heads of the three deceased. This seems like quite a, a caring and tender thing to do. So what does it mean? Well, quite often there's a confusion between the person and the physical body. And it can take a while when somebody dies, particularly in a sudden or unexpected way, to make that shift in thinking about them as, as merely a corpse. Now, clearly, these women were dead or dying when this happened to them, but does that show you that the person who did it actually has a very close relationship with them? It could well be the case. Things were looking bad for Thomas May, although there was still no motive. But Roberts had an answer for this, and it was a hard one to argue with. Perhaps some inscrutable trick of the mind had converted a loving husband and father into a homicidal maniac. May was formally committed to stand trial at the Exeter Assizes. His family had been killed. Now he too was fighting for his life. Because of his injuries, May was allowed to give his evidence seated. Speaking in what the newspapers called a cultured voice, May said that from the time he went to bed until he found himself in a Plymouth nursing home, his memory was a complete blank. Somewhat poignantly, he described his final words to his wife on the stairs before going to bed. She put her arm around me and gave me a kiss and a punch in the ribs, saying, I have some mending to do, but I shall be up directly. I never saw her again. When Mr. Justice Charles took his seat as judge on Monday, November the 9th, G.D. Roberts noted that he seemed anxious to deal in summary fashion with some of the cases on his list because of the pressures of a heavy court calendar. But despite this pressure from the judge, the defense were about to see their first glimmer of hope. Dr. Gerald Robinson, who attended May in Kingsbridge Infirmary, gave evidence that was to shake the prosecution case to its core. Describing the defendant's injuries at the time, he said that May could not open his eyes owing to hemorrhage and swelling of the eyelids. In one place, the outer table of the skull was fractured. In another place, over the ear, the skull was driven in like a broken egg. For the prosecution, Mr. Roberts now asked, can you say anything as to how these injuries were inflicted? Are they consistent with having been inflicted by a walling hammer? The doctor replied, I think so. Can you say if they are consistent with having been inflicted when he was standing up or when he was lying down? 
They looked to me as if they were given to him while he was lying in bed. Why? Because the three scalp wounds were in exactly the same place. At this point, the judge intervened. Would any of these three be sufficient to render him unconscious, he asked. Straight away, my lord, said Dr. Robinson. Under further questioning from the defense, the doctor said the first blow alone would have been sufficient to render Thomas May unconscious at once. Again, the judge intervened. Do you think it conceivable that he could have done it himself? Not the least bit, said the doctor. So it looked as if May couldn't have inflicted the wounds himself to divert blame, unless he had an accomplice. So were these injuries self-inflicted? Well, it would seem very implausible that they were. But does that necessarily mean that Farmer Tom is innocent of the three murders? Well, not necessarily. As a, as a possible scenario, let's say that somebody finds that Master Tom has uh, created this havoc and he offers him a solution. I'm going to make it look as though you have been the victim and not the offender in this case. If that is the case, it's a very, very risky strategy because I would imagine that hitting a 72-year-old over the head with a lump hammer could very easily have been fatal. Could the prosecution have done more to prove that May or an accomplice had inflicted his wounds? At the trial, Mr Roberts, uh, representing the prosecution case, uh, made comments about the positions of the wounds to Thomas May's body in relation to whether it could have been inflicted when he was standing up or lying down. Photographs of Mr May could have indicated that if blood had drained over his hair, for example, or down the side of his face. So I think the, the issue of whether the wounds would have administered could have been better addressed. But the accomplice possibility was not put forward and the defence were making ground. The prosecution's case was collapsing and Roberts knew it. He recalled... The judge fixed his eyes on me and said, there is no more reason for supposing May had struck the others than that the others had struck him. It was a broad hint that he wanted me to throw in my hand, which I could not ignore. I said at once that I would offer no evidence. A verdict of not guilty was returned on each of the three charges. It does seem strange that the case has fallen on one answer to one question by the witness, the doctor. It's such a fundamental point, could Thomas May have injured himself or not? What's not clear is how much experience the doctor has of examining victims of head injuries. Mr May for some reason declined to go to hospital, perhaps his head was never x-rayed, uh, it would have needed a hospital visit in those days, I'm sure. So how could the doctor be so sure that the injuries were inflicted by someone else? May duly stepped from the dock, a free man. Thank God that terrible time is over, he said. I knew I would be proved innocent. A year after the murders, the farm was let to a Mr Coker of Norfolk and the implement stock and equipment were sold. Thomas May was effectively destroyed by the case. Described by some villagers as previously a strict and overbearing man, he apparently suffered a nervous breakdown before his eventual death. Reflecting years later, Prosecutor Roberts could not conceal his disquiet at the sudden and unexpected conclusion to the trial. Who then is responsible for the slaughter at the farm, he wrote. I think more could have been done to solve this case from a forensic perspective. Um, obviously great interest was put forward about Mr May's injuries and whether they were self-inflicted. But obviously Mr Lockhart's presence at the scene is, is a particular interest and there is no doubt that if, if, for example, his clothing and footwear was examined, it probably would have shown the presence of blood from, from the deceased. But again, it's a distribution of blood on, on his clothing which could have been very, very important. I think that what sticks out for me in this case is why wasn't Lockhart examined much more closely? Because I still think that his behaviour upon finding blood seeping underneath the doorway was really quite strange. There's something fishy about that that I, as a psychologist, would feel compelled to investigate. But Lockhart had an alibi for the relevant period, backed by a church hall full of people. So he couldn't have been involved in the crime. I am not convinced of Thomas May's innocence or guilt. A good comparison is the Jeremy Bamber case in 1985, also in a farmhouse, 
police officers found five people who'd all been shot to death. Bamba supplied the police with the potential explanation that his sister Sheila, who had a history of mental illness, had shot four members of the family before turning the gun on herself. When it transpired after further examination, and some of this by family members who weren't satisfied with the first conclusion that the police had reached, it transpired that it was in fact Jeremy Bamber himself and he was convicted of five murders. It also emerged during the hearings that the walling hammer had been placed in a cupboard in the kitchen the previous evening. I think Farmer Tom was innocent. For a start, crime writers like the police always look for a motive and there really does seem to be none in this case. I wonder, the two girls, Farmer Tom's two daughters, had been out for the evening. Could they not have been followed home by what we would now call a stalker? Maybe Farmer Tom went to their rescue when they were attacked. Maybe the axe was kept in the kitchen for just that purpose, for self-defence. The intruder theory does not provide a motive. Some years after the case, the judge put forward yet another scenario. Maybe there was a struggle between Gwyneth and her father on the stairs. Perhaps she collapsed and was incapable of action. Maybe she fell headfirst down the stairs while still alive and thus received the injuries from which she died. Gwyneth alone had time to put on a dressing gown and slippers. She was not attacked while she was in bed. The walling hammer had hairs from May, his wife and Joan, not from Gwyneth. Could the young fit Gwyneth have initiated the violence? After all, hers was the only hair that wasn't found on the hammer and the hammer was found pretty close to her body. Was it an intruder? Were the wounds self-inflicted? What was the role of Lockhart and daughter Gwyneth? Nobody was brought to justice for this heinous crime when a close-knit and apparently loving rural family was savagely torn apart and left for dead, burnt, blooded and destroyed.